I think it's so exciting, even for Christian believers. They should welcome this because these authors are not saying Jesus is uh, like uh, different mythological characters. He's better than them. They die heroically, but Jesus does too. He rises from the dead. Hello, lovely people. Welcome back to my channel. Welcome if you are new. Today, we are going to jump straight into a fabulous interview with Dennis MacDonald. We're going to talk about the influence of Greek poetry and the epics on the Gospels. It's fascinating stuff. I really enjoyed this interview. This topic does tie in with a course that Dennis made with Derek from the Myth Vision podcast. So do check out the links down below for access to that course and to Dennis's book. I found this really fascinating. I hope you enjoy it too. Okay, today we are going to be talking about reading the Gospels with an eye on Greek poetry. Greek poetry, this um, mimesis uh, criticism discussion is not something I know that much about, so I'm really excited to be talking to Dennis MacDonald. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh, it's a pleasure, Emma. Nice to meet you. Awesome. So, as far as I can tell, you're really something of a pioneer on this subject. Can you explain a little why there is such skepticism, sort of reluctance, or just an absence of this mimesis criticism? Well, I think it is fair to say that I'm a pioneer in the field. And what happens with pioneers is you don't settle, put up settlements, you just kind of push back the barriers. Mm -hmm. And pushing back the barriers is difficult for any uh, academic um, discipline. And what I'm discovering are what I would think are kind of uh, inconvenient truths about early Christianity mm. that uh, the church is not welcoming, but also academics aren't, because if I'm right, so much that's been written on the Gospels is wrong. Now, that's not to say that these people are uh, that, you know, that are uh, skeptical of a nemesis criticism are wicked people, but they're committed to a discipline that is not equipped to understand the Homeric epics um, as a background to the Gospels. And there's a, a long history of this. I mean, you can uh, look at the scholarship that's uh, written in commentaries and so on, it's absent. Even in reference materials, um, there are no cross references to uh, any Greek poetry in lexica or in uh, commentaries, or um, I'll give an example, um, in the critical edition of the New Testament that we call Nestle uh, 28, there are several thousand citations or allusions to the Jewish scriptures, that is the Septuagint. There are five to classical Greek literature, only one to poetry, none to Homer, none to Virgil. Now you get the impression that the early Christian church did nothing but have Bible studies of the Hebrew Bible. No, they're living in a culture that is saturated with the uh, Greek poetry, and that's the definitive stuff. And so the discipline has been um, ill-equipped to understand Greek poetry. But there are some other issues too, Emma. One, reading um, classical Greek poetry, Homer and um, uh, Athenian uh, tragedy, is very difficult. Mm. It's not Koine Greek. It's, so you actually have to learn a different Greek. And this was even true for students in the first century who were themselves Greek speakers. Right. Um, they hated going to school and having to learn Homer because nobody was speaking like that. There are all kinds of uh, hopox legomena, the, the things, words that appear only once. Well, what's a student to do with that? So they actually had their own lexicon going from Homeric Greek to Koine Greek so the students could uh, understand what they were reading. And often they understood what was reading in order to compose. So they really needed to have that. But I think there is a certain amount of fear and jealousy. Very few scholars actually have engaged my work um, from my guild. I know of nobody in the guild that has yet read my book on synopses of uh, epic and poetry. It, I've been blackballed. The only public speaking I've been invited to do by the church or by the academy was one debate 
So obviously, I was set up uh, by uh, an apologist in order to debunk what I'm doing. But nobody has asked me to come and to talk um, about these materials. And I think it's so exciting, even for Christian believers. They should welcome this because these authors are not saying Jesus is uh, like uh, different mythological characters. He's better than them than they. Um, they die heroically, but Jesus does too. He rises from the dead. So that you have this um, cultural inertia um, in the uh, the guild of, the, um, of New Testament scholarship that I really think is fearful uh, uh, about having such a radical new proposal. That's so interesting. And I think that's why it's really good that we're here today and we have think your so books too. and your course. It would be such a shame to miss out on this. Um, so because there is that kind of skepticism um, and the topic of you know, inspiration and influence is so subjective, uh, can you tell me what the criteria you are uh, using to establish like a reasonable mimetic connection between the texts? That is uh, the seven criteria that yeah. try to take some subjectivity out of it. That is uh, the accessibility of the model, in this case, Homer, the um, presence of analogous imitations, so other people are doing it too, um, the density of parallels, their sequence, and any distinctive traits that uh, are can be used to flag that one text is interpreting another or rewriting another. Um, the reason why someone would do it and also um, the, uh, the reception of or recognition of this imitation by early readers. Now, this is a, an important piece, Emma. These texts in the New Testament, especially in Mark, frequently notify the reader of the Homeric connection. You can see this in the Acts of the Apostles, where a young man who is um, raised from the dead, his name is Eutychus, and his name means lucky. He has a parallel in the Odyssey that is picked up twice by Virgil in, uh, in, in stories of, uh, about a youngster who dies and uh, goes to Hades, uh, where um, uh, Odysseus meets Elpenor, or Aeneas meets Messenus or Pelinorus. Um, and in the Odyssey, the, as this Elpenor is several times called unfortunate Elpenor. Well, he's unfortunate because he dies as a young man, never gets home, has to go to Hades and stay there. Um, but Eutychus, Mr. Lucky, um, is revived at dawn, and so uh, he truly is lucky. Well, th th this is a flag to the reader. Hey, this guy's um, a, a luckier fellow than uh, El Panor in, in uh, Odyssey uh, 10 and 11. Uh, something, part of the reason I wanted to talk about the, um, the criteria is because uh, that ancient people identifying these stories are references to Greek writing um, is interesting to me because I've seen people deny that so frequently. So I was going to poke you for an example. So thank you for giving it to me. Do any of the Gospels stand out particularly to you as being more heavily inspired than others by the, the Greek? I, I, I feel like I have a guess at what, at what you're going to say. So. Well, it's going to be the Gospel of Mark. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Matthew and Luke accept most of the Homeric imitations that they find in Mark and Luke, in particular, adds a bunch of them. So uh, maybe we can talk about some of those later. Do you have, I've got to ask, do you have a favorite um, sort of comparison reference uh, in the Gospels to the Greek epics? I actually have two favorites, if I could use that. Of course. Uh, one from the Odyssey and one from the Iliad. The one from the Odyssey is the story of Polyphemus, and Circe. Odysseus and his 12 men put their ship you know, on a distant island and encounter a caveman. 
And um, the caveman asks um, Odysseus what his name is, and he dissimulates and says, my name is nobody, Utus. The cannibal uh, Polyphemus um, eats two of Odysseus's men. So they have to decide how to get out of the cave, but they can't move this huge doorstone. Only Polyphemus can. So they blind the one eye of Polyphemus and they escape um, from the uh, the tomb, uh, I mean, from the cave. And they the men uh, tied underneath the sheep are able to escape. Uh, Odysseus then uh, shouts back from the ship and says, uh, Odysseus did this, uh, tell everybody about it. In the Circe story, Odysseus and his men go to a different island, encounter a witch who's a cannibal, and she turns the soldiers into swine. Now, Odysseus returns them back to their rightful state, but in the end, they all drown in the sea. Okay, in the Gospel um, of Mark, but also picked up by Matthew and Luke, Mm -hmm. Jesus and his 12 men on a boat put into a a shore. They encounter a savage man who lives among the caves. In this case, there's a different dissimulation. Um, Jesus asks the, the, the caveman, Uh, what is your name? And he says, we are a legion. So instead of nobody, we're what? A a legion. So what does uh, Jesus do to, um, he he exercises the demons, he uh, casts them into swine, and then he drowns them. Demoniac calls back to him and says, can I come with you? And Jesus says, no, go tell everybody what the Lord has done for you. Instead of uh, Odysseus, uh, calling back and to say, uh, tell everybody how I have blinded you. Uh, but the other th- reason I like it is that Byzantine intellectuals, when they rewrote the story of the Gerasene demoniac, used without alteration the first 11 lines of the Homeric epic in order to do so. So that's uh, my favorite from the Odyssey. It's, it's really pretty obvious when you see it broken down that way. My favorite from the Iliad has to do with the death of uh, Hector and the death of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Um, Hector um, realizes after he's encountered uh, Achilles and his brother Deiphobus has vanished because he actually was Athena who's in disguise. Um, He realizes that his god Apollo had abandoned him and he dies with a shout Uh, Three women from Troy lead the laments, um, Andromache, Hecuba, and Helen. But Achilles keeps the corpse so that Priam has to go in the danger of night to ransom the body of his son and bring him back to great wailing. And the Iliad ends there with the death of, with the burial of Hector, but the reader knows that now Troy is about to fall. In the Gospel of Mark, uh, Jesus is crucified, and he there's a uh, uh, the darkness over the earth, and Jesus says, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" He dies with a shout. Three women watch from a distance and uh, lead the lamentation and uh, come to bury him. But a Priam, I mean, uh, uh, Joseph of Arimathea has to go at night and rescue the body of uh, Jesus and give him a burial. But whereas Hector dies and doesn't uh, revive, uh, Jesus does revive and then offers uh, salvation to those who believe in him. At least that's the Christian mythology. So fascinating. So many, there's so many interesting parallels. I like that we... It goes on and on. Well, I could talk to you about this for hours. I like that at a certain point, you sort of forget whether you're talking, are we talking about the the Greek or the the gospel version? Um, Yeah, it's fun. Well, I think the, um, many of the narratives that appear in the gospel of Mark about women actually are transforms of stories in um, 
in Homer that had to do with men. Mm. So for the, I'll just give you one example. Glaucus uh, cannot help rescue um, Sar Sarpedon, um, the body of Sarpedon, because he suffered his own wound 12 books earlier in, uh, or no, about four books earlier in the Iliad. And so he prays to Apollo and says to Apollo, um, uh, uh, Lord, please heal my wound so that I can help my friend, because the noblest of the, uh, the, the Trojans has, uh, 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 has died. Uh, no, of the, of the uh, yeah, of the, of the, anyway. Um, and he, Apollo heals him, and the, the narrator says, and Glaucus knew in his soul that he had been healed. And then he can go and uh, help uh, rescue the body of Sarpedon. Mm -hmm. In the Gospel of Mark, there's a woman who is hemorrhaging. She cannot, and by the way, in, in the Iliad, uh, none of the doctors um, were able to uh, heal uh, poor Sarpedon. Mm -hmm. um, and in the gospel, you have a woman who's hemorrhaging for 12 years. Nobody can uh, heal her. None of the physicians can. Um, she uh, uses her faith to touch Jesus' garment and uh, thus is healed. And it says, and she knew in herself that she had been healed. And then Jesus says, uh, it says of Jesus, and Jesus knew in himself that the power had gone out of him. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Homero Centones um, retell the story, and by the way, one of the great uh, poets of the Homeric Gentonis was Evdosia, um, the wife of Theodosius II, a woman. Um, they retell the story of the hemorrhaging woman by using these very lines from the Iliad. I mean, it's just so amazing. And you have these other kinds of gender transforms happening in the Gospels that you would not identify um, had you not understood mimesis. That's amazing. That's so cool. And another reason this is so fascinating to me. That's awesome. Thank you so much, Dennis. I, I had to self-publish this book because I couldn't find a publisher to pick it up. And I that think That itself is a whole isn't it, discussion. Isn't it, yeah, yeah. isn't it amazing? But yeah. um, because of that, I went through Amazon and Amazon has not been good about shipping a heavy book overseas. Uh, and so this is for you and for anyone else. I know that people in South America, Africa, um, Australia have wanted the Asia have wanted the book. And I'm going to make alternative, um, make it possible for you to get those books um, in one way or another at some mm -hmm. point. So uh, anybody who's listening, and in this case, especially Emma, if you have trouble getting a hold of the synopses, you let me know. And uh, we'll make an arrangement. There we are, a wonderful little interview. Do let me know if you enjoyed it. I am very keen, because we barely scratched the surface here today, I am very keen to get Dennis back and do maybe a long form interview video, uh, maybe a live stream, because there is so much to talk about, even with, even regarding the publishing of his book. This topic is so almost taboo. It's met with such resistance in uh, academia as well as apologetics that there is so much to talk about there so do let me know if you'd like to hear from Dennis again because I would really like to do that do remember to check out the links down below do subscribe to this channel there's a whole playlist on my channel of scholarly videos so make sure you check that out do subscribe so you don't miss future ones so you don't miss any future conversations with Dennis on this topic mimetic criticism it's fascinating I can't wait to read through his book most importantly make sure you have a very lovely week and I will see you really soon